So thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'm here with uh, the, the Dean. <laughs> uh, I've been actually trying to get Dean for many years now to do functional conference and other conferences I run. Uh, and, and it's a real honor to have him uh, amongst us, uh, you know, I've I actually, uh, my first recollection of Dean is reading the chapter in Clean Code book, uh, which he had uh, contributed to along with uh, uh, Uncle Bob's book. Uh, and then onwards, I think I have I had the uh, opportunity or privilege to run into him in a few, few cases. And then of course, when the Scala book came out, uh, which uh, I think is 2008, 2009 timeframe, uh, you know, I was just telling him that, uh, you know, Venkat Subramaniam and he both had the book out at the same time. So, you know, it was kind of a, a hard moment to see, you know, because I'm not good at reading books with which one to go. <laughs> And certainly uh, now you're up to the third edition uh, of the book. So that's that's uh, very impressive and congratulations on that. And uh, thanks for all the contributions you've made to uh, the functional programming community in general, but uh, Scala particularly, I think you've uh, you put in a lot of sweat uh, behind that. Uh, and of course, these days, uh, Dean is working with IBM and uh, doing a lot of interesting work. I think uh, he'll probably touch upon some of these. Over to you, Dean. Thanks again for coming in. Thanks, Naresh. It's great to be here. It's uh, it's actually a privilege to be here. As you said, it's been a long time and we've talked about it and, uh, and it was great to catch up too. I uh, really enjoyed finding out what you're up to as well. Let me go ahead and get set up here. All right, I think I have everything. And I will try to answer questions as they come up. I have a, the Q&A window open. Um, so my name is Dean Wampler. Uh, there's a couple of links here if you want to follow me on Twitter. Uh, also, I've been blogging about Scala 3 uh, since I started, uh, it was since about the time the book came out, uh, the third edition. So you can just find me at uh, deanwampler.medium.com or send me email at uh, <clears throat> yeah, my email address. Excuse me. <coughs> mm. All right. Oh, and the photos. Uh, this was a trip around Nevada that I did uh, actually middle of last year during one of the lulls in COVID, uh, some backpacking and driving around. So uh, interesting place if you ever get a chance to go there. So yeah, I actually work for IBM Research. I joined about two months ago. And uh, the reason I joined was to lead an engineering team that is uh, trying to promote what we're calling accelerated discovery as in scientific discovery. So IBM has a bunch of science assets in research, a lot of things about like modeling chemistry, Quantum computing turns out to be a very good system for simulating uh, chemical interactions these days. And, and that's actually become a viable use of it, even though it's still a very early technology. So the platform is really kind of doing the stuff that most of us do, which is build production grade software, you know, on Kubernetes, you know, the, you know, the whole nine yards, but to make it much easier for research scientists and even the people with an IBM to access and use and sequence these scientific toolkits for drug discovery, uh, carbon capture discovery, uh, that kind of stuff for climate mitigation uh, and other materials research, just a whole bunch of things that uh, are kind of fun to play with. And that's that's kind of what got me really interested in doing this was working on, on a mission like this of uh, building stuff. We are actually hiring. Uh, I don't have a good link for the um, our open recs at the moment, but definitely follow up if you're interested in finding out more about, about the team. Um, as Naresh said, I, I uh, published the third edition of Programming Scala last year, uh, almost a complete rewrite really, so go out and buy a new copy <laughs> um, because I, I basically updated it uh, in significantly for Scala 3. Uh, and as I'm gonna discuss, I, I really like a lot of what uh, they put into Scala 3. They fixed a lot of little warts uh, interesting decisions they made that have actually come to like. I, I hope it's a very successful uh, addition of the language, but it is kind of a, a major update. Although I have to say, <clears throat> they've done a pretty good job with backwards compatibility. You can use 2.13 libraries. You can actually use Scala 3 compiled libraries in the latest release of Scala 2.13. So they worked really hard for backwards compatibility, but there are some things that have changed. So you, you know, if you decide to upgrade, you will have to uh, take, take a little time at least to, uh, to fix a few things that have changed in the language. Okay, so basically what I wanna talk about is uh, first, how Scala has evolved. Um, in particular, how Scala 3 provides greater clarity about certain constructs, how they've rethought the way implicits work. This is like the power mechanism in Scala that everyone talks about, either for good or for ill. Uh, it's like anything, it can be misused. 
And one of the things they've tried to do is move away from having to memorize idiosyncratic uses of this underlying mechanism to provide contextual abstractions that are more fit for purpose, you know, that are more directly obvious about what they're doing and less about learning the, the, the sort of idiosyncratic uh, idioms for uh, doing things like adding methods dynamically to types and so forth. And there are some improvements to the type system that I'll talk about briefly as well that are kind of interesting. I also want to talk about, you know, lessons learned from 15 years is, you know, what I've observed about people building uh, software in Scala versus Java or whatever. I kind of put enterprise Scala in quotes because I don't want us to write enterprise Java that's written in Scala. I've seen that and I'll talk about that a little bit, but just, you know, various things that some of which will be pretty obvious to this crowd, you know, like the virtues of FP over object oriented programming, but also talk a little bit about where I think people get carried away. Um, uh, you know, like trying to treat everything as needing to be uh, typed and so forth. And, and, you know, where you strike the balance there and just the idea that Scala helps promote reduction of code, uh, which is a really a great value. All of our problems get smaller as our code bases get smaller, basically. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about the future, that, uh, just sort of a worrying trend about, you know, whether FP adoption is going to stall or not, and why I think that that might be the case for a couple of reasons, one of which will, uh, will be obvious, the other one may be less obvious, and I'll talk about that a bit. Okay, so on the subject of greater clarity, um, one of the things they did, uh, this is a, a, something Martin Adursky, the creator of Scala, really wanted to do is he introduced this new uh, indentation or significant indentation syntax like Python, like Haskell, where you get rid of braces. It's, it's optional. You don't have to do this. Uh, you can use braces if you want. Uh, when I first saw this, I thought this was really a bad idea because you know a lot of people uh, complain that Scala is too complex, too many ways to do things. I don't think very fairly, actually, uh, if you, especially if you look, Adursky says this all the time, the grammar of Scala is actually simpler than the grammar of Java because Java has a lot more special cases. Um, but this seemed like one of those things is kind of a gratuitous difference. Why would you do this? But I decided to go ahead and use this syntax in the book. And I actually really came to like it by the end that it, it just adds just a little bit more clarity. Scala is already really well known for being concise and uh, you know, letting you write uh, uh, quite a lot of functionality with relatively little amount of you know, characters. And this just takes us to the next level of that. So you know, just hopefully you can see from these two examples that um, you know, just getting rid of the braces actually does actually add a little bit more uh, cleanliness to your code. So I've actually come to really like this syntax. But uh, one of the big things, uh, you know, maybe more profound improvements is really trying to get rid of the need to memorize idiosyncratic uses of this powerful mechanism called implicits and replace or at least complement those uses with more directly applicable abstractions. So if you know Scala, you, you know about arrow associ. This is that famous uh, type that's been in the, the library for a long time where as you see in the bubble, if I write A arrow B, like it's not actually something built into the grammar when I wanna create a two element tuple, it actually invokes this implicit mechanism that converts that A object into an arrow associ object or you know, basically wraps it. And then this arrow method is called and that returns a tuple with the A on the left and whatever you pass as an argument, the B value on the right uh, and that returns a two element tuple. Um, and this is exactly the way it looks. Uh, I think I copied it faithfully out of the, uh, the source code for Scala 213. Now, this is a really cool mechanism. We used it a lot, but there are two problems with it. One of them is if you're learning Scala, this makes no sense at all. You, you kind of have to just learn. This is the idiomatic way that you do what is essentially extension methods that are truly available in other languages. Um, and the other thing is there's this sort of overhead of, of wrapping this object. Now, maybe that the compiler can actually uh, optimize that away. But, you know, in the naive case, you would be just creating these little throwaway objects to do the wrapping. So Scala 3 on the right hand side finally adds true extension methods. You know, this is what the syntax looks like, you know, extension for some type A, um, then define this method. I actually use tilde greater than instead of using arrow or, you know, line arrow uh, greater than, because it turns out Scala 3 in part for backwards compatibility, uh, compatibility does use the Scala 213 library. So in fact, arrow associ is still in Scala 3, and that's actually what gets invoked if you use this mechanism. 
but you know, eventually that'll get replaced and it'll be just a regular extension method uh, written like I did on the right. Much more concise, hopefully easier to understand, much more directly applicable to the abstraction, uh, the idea that you're trying to create here. And so this, uh, this idea of using implicits generally falls into the, the category of contextual abstractions. You know, I'm trying to do something in a particular context and there's been other things that have been added to uh, you know, make this work. So let's look at uh, some other examples here. So this is a functional programming conference. I have to have at least something that looks like a, a you know, category theory concept. So on the left, I defined a trait called semi-group. Semi-group is just the abstraction over you know, integer addition or whatever. Uh, and then monoid extends that with adding the notion of a unit value. In you know, integer addition, it would be zero. Integer multiplication, it would be one. You know, so that you know, zero plus x equals x, that kind of stuff. But notice the syntax here. Um, so I declare this, this trait, you know, this thing that I'll use as a mix-in or a superclass. And then I, I'm to declare an extension method in the trait because I want every single object that is a semi-group to have this unique ability to uh, basically do addition. Um, I, I forgot to mention what target name is about on the previous slide. Target name is an annotation that actually tells the compiler what name to use for this object in JVM bytecode or this method rather. You might recall that um, you know, uh, Scala lets you use things like these you know, operator symbols and so forth, which are not legal in, in uh, Java itself or in the, in, you know, the bytecode standard. So uh, this is actually the name that would show up in bytecode. Now you can't actually, you cannot call this method from Scala using PLUS, but you could call it from Java if you wanted to. So that, that's the purpose for this annotation target name. But anyway, so I've got, essentially two extension methods here, one of which is this sort of Darth Vader operator, you know, for plus, and all it does is turn around and call this combine method, which um, I, another key word, you now have to uh, declare things that you want to be able to use as infix operators if they are not using operator symbols. So combine is using ASCII text. Another area where they felt that Scala got a little ahead of, you know, or people used it in ways that maybe wasn't really a appropriate for comprehensibility and avoiding uh, com uh, compilation ambiguities is the overuse of infix notation, where, where we just drop the periods and, and drop the parentheses. So now, if you have an ask, ASCII type uh, or an ASCII name of something, and you want to use it in, in an infix context, you have to uh, prefix with this keyword infix. Now, there is some backwards compatibility things. We've all done this with the standard you know, collection operators like map and flat map and so forth. And it would break too much code if that wasn't uh, supported going forward. So there are cases where they're sort of grandfathering in the ability to do this. But as a rule, it's another example of trying to make our code a little bit more precise in the sort of idioms that we're using. So, um, so keep that in mind that uh, that's why the infix is here. It's a new keyword. And that's the method that has to be defined in concrete subclasses of this trait along with unit. Now, one thing you'll notice about the, the unit method in monoid versus the combined method in semi-group is that combine is defined as an extension method. So it becomes an instance method, something that's applied to instances of a semi-group. But we really only need one unit method per type, like integers, floats, big ints, whatever. So that's actually going to turn into a, uh, the, like the um, companion object method. And, and so it's not declared as an extension method. And the bottom example then is actually a string monoid. The way I declare an implicit version or an implicit instance of something now is with this new given keyword. So given some string monoid, then uh, it's going to subclass. It, actually, it's, I'm declaring an instance of this thing. I'm not even creating the subclass. Um, so it'll be a monoid of type string. And now I define units and the extension method combine in the usual way that you would for strings. And then on the right-hand side, you, could, you can see what it would look like if I actually use this. This operator obeys the associativity rules for addition. Uh, not always true for all uh, monoids, but that's true in this case. And, um, and notice, notice how we reference the unit object. We, we call it like a companion object method or, or, or member uh, string monoid.unit in the bottom case. Uh, just one more example of this. So, uh, you know, how would I get like type parameters in this? So uh, numeric is a great example. I don't want to declare, I don't want to have a given instance for every single type of thing that I can do addition that's like, you know, floats, doubles, big ints, and so forth. I can use numeric for this. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with Scala, this T colon numeric basically means that there's some uh, implicit instance of a numeric that's going to exist for the type T I'm trying to use. So there won't be one of those for say, you know, the class of user or something, unless I actually define a numeric for, for user types, but there would be in the library already for int, big int and so forth. So a little bit similar to what we saw before. Now we use the summon method. If you, there was an implicitly method before in Scala 2. Uh, it's basically the same method, really just a new name. Uh, actually, both of them are still there. Uh, so summon says, all right, there was that instance that, that made me able to declare this uh, numeric object for some type T, now grab it because I need to get the, uh, the zero. It was what, what it's called in, in numeric. That's what I'm using as my unit here. Um, and similarly, when I do the combine method, I need to get that numeric instance that's in scope and then call plus to actually implement my addition operator. And you can see on the right what happens. I don't have to declare anything else. It just magically works now for ints, doubles, and big ints. And you can see how I reference the uh, the unit values where I have to now supply. I actually don't necessarily have to supply the type like int or double. In the int case as written, it would actually infer that it's an int. But on the bottom one where the double comes first, I have to put in the double there. Just you know, a little bit of a, a type inference warding, if you will. Okay. And then finally, another common use of uh, these implicits was to pass context, like let's say a session object when you're doing you know, web processing or something. So I just made up a very simple example of some trait with some information that's contextual. And then I'll have a particular implicit instance, again, with this given keyword that will be one of those instances. And I um, you know, declare the value uh, that's returned by string to be cloud, exclamation point. And the way this is normally used in Scala is where you see this using clause now that would not have to be provided explicitly when I call this process method. Now, instead of calling it implicitly uh, or implicit rather some argument or arguments, we now use a new keyword called using. I probably should have put it in yellow type because it's a keyword. Uh, but notice I don't actually have to name this, this object, uh, the, the, this context object. I can just use summon once again to fetch it. Uh, when I need uh, need it in order to get this uh, this info string, uh, it is obviously a very trivial contrived example, but just showing the analog of how we've often used implicit argument lists to provide contextual information. And then just an example of how it might work, where by default it's you know when I call process, uh, it's going to return AWS dash cloud exclamation mark. If I create a new given uh, instance in in this context, it'll actually shadow the other one that I declared uh, on the left hand side. And now when I call this, or if I pass it explicitly, then I'm going to get this new string as output. So just how that you know example of how that might work. Okay, so. In general, though, they thought about, all right, how do people actually use implicits or how have they been used in the past? Let's actually put some mechanisms in the language that are more explicitly about those contextual abstractions. So they're easier to learn, easier and simpler to write uh, and debug as a result, and also uh, just more intuitive. So let's talk about changes to the type system. <clears throat> and I won't go into a lot, uh, into all of them. There's quite a lot of changes here. Uh, one of them that's kind of interesting is something called opaque type aliases. Now. Um, uh, this solves a problem that uh, was solved with the previous mechanism that still exists called value types where, you know, suppose I have a conceptual idea in my uh, domain like logarithms, but in fact they're implemented with just a single uh, primitive type, in this case a double. We don't really want to be creating uh, object wrappers all over the place. I can have millions of these logarithms in a, in a you know, like a big data app, and I really don't want all of that you know, little wrapper stuff in, in my heap. It's going to slow things down, use a lot of memory. At the bytecode level, I'd really like the compiler to just use doubles everywhere uh, and substitute in, you know, the method calls as required or whatever. Uh, there has been this thing called value types where you could declare these. Value types had some strengths and weaknesses. It turns out this type alias <clears throat> is a complementary mechanism. So value types are still there. But this one is sometimes uh, useful in ways that value types aren't. I won't go into a lot of the details here. One of my blog posts discusses this, but just to, you know, how you would declare this is, you declare it as like a regular type alias inside some object, but with this opaque keyword. And that means that it's, uh, you know, what's inside this logarithm type wrapper, if you will, 
is invisible outside of this object called log. Log was a bad uh, name choice, I guess. Um, but, uh, but you do have to define methods for converting doubles to logarithms and working with them uh, you know, is like you know, using like the, the operators that we know and love. So th these first two methods that I define, apply and then safe, are basically constructor-like methods that return you know, a logarithm uh, object. Uh, the second one being a, a, a one that will check that you're not passing a negative double because that would you know, blow up to minus infinity. Um, so in this case, it returns an option wrapping uh, the value or none. And then we use extension methods to define all of the uh, instance methods that we want to be uh, usable in logarithm like plus and, and multiplication, um, and also just extracting the double back out. So a nice mechanism that gives you that runtime efficiency of working with primitives, but lets you think about uh, domain abstractions like logarithms. And then the last two things I'll talk about on the type system are true intersection and union types so that the type system behaves more like or follows more that the rules of set theory. Like, for example, these two types are actually interchangeable or, or rather uh, uh, commutative. Uh, there's certain ways in which they aren't, which I won't get into. But, um, but the, something that's resettable and growable is, a, is considered equivalent to something that's growable and resettable. So notice the function at the bottom first. It, all I care about is I want to pass in something that I can reset the contents in some sense, like you know, it's a mutable collection or whatever. And I can also add stuff to it and the stuff and the, the stuff inside this collection are strings. But um, I don't care what the, actually this thing is, what the, the particular type is. I just want it to uh, have both of these mix in traits as part of its type so that I can call reset. I can call add to string. Of course, I could call uh, in, in any case. But uh, that's, that's the idea, that only values that are both resettable and growable can be passed here. Um, and it adds true set theory kind of behavior, like commutativity of, of, these, uh, you know, of this composition that didn't exist in the previous way of, of using ex, uh, you know, extension, uh, extend and width to uh, mix in traits. This apparently gets rid of a bunch of uh, warty situations where you have a, you know, like a runaway type expansion. And, and the complement would be union type. So notice the signature of get user. I'm going to call a database. I'm going to return some instances of this user type at the beginning with the name and password. But notice what it returns. It's either going to return a string, which will be for the error situation where maybe I didn't find anything, or it's going to return a single user, or it's going to return a sequence of users if there happens to be uh, reused IDs. Now, of course, I could have just returned a sequence and made it empty if it's you know nothing there or you know, a sequence of one, but just to illustrate how this works, I, you know, use this construction. So inside this method, I'm going to call my, uh, you know, DBC connection uh, with, uh, you know, some query that just selects all of the users uh, for this ID. Uh, and then I'm going to match on the results and either return a string that I didn't find any or return the first element, you know, converting whatever this result set record is into a user. You know, I'm sort of glossing over those details or map that result set into some sequence of users. And if I get an exception, then I'll just return the message for the exception. Now, because I'm returning one of three types, when I actually call it at the bottom here, I have to use pattern matching to determine what I get. So it's either gonna be a string again, or a single user or a sequence of users. And so that's how you work with these return types. You always just use match clauses. So another cool thing that you can do once again, the types are considered commutative. So uh, if, uh, you know, if I have an instance of string or a user or sequence of users, it's a considered equivalent to an instance of, or you know, type equivalent to user or string or sequence of user, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's move on to you know, kind of lessons learned from 15 years of Scala. Um, you know, first, Kind of preaching to the choir here. Obviously, the benefits of object-oriented programming were kind of superseded by the benefits of functional programming. Most importantly, the idea that we should really emphasize immutability and not have unconstrained mutability, which is what object-oriented programming, at least in the naive sense, uh, allowed us to do. But it also really, really promoted uh, more concise code. And I think a great example of this is to think about SQL. It's hard to think of anything more concise than a SQL query uh, in most cases. 
And it really is a great example of taking sort of you know, mathematical rigor and boiling it down to its essence. In this case, it's more set theory than um, you know, maybe like category theory or whatever. But it really is a very concise way of expressing what I want. But in, most importantly, not telling the system how to do it, but telling the system what I want in sort of a logical sense and then letting the system figure out how best to provide that result. And as we all know, you know, databases have really good query optimizers. They often are indexed and so forth. So um, th this is usually a very fast operation compared to me, like, you know, iterating through a source file and finding the things that I want and so forth, a uh, data file, I guess. Another powerful idea that we've leveraged a lot in Scala is the notion of parametric polymorphism. Uh, and I just want to give you a sense of what this is, but this blog post here, uh, uh, talk about it a little bit, including some things that occurred to me that maybe aren't the, the most obvious benefits of this. But you know, consider these two functions. You have no idea what these are doing necessarily because the names are completely opaque. If you think about the second one first, foo2, if I pass in a sequence of integers and return an int, there's quite a few uh, implementations that would satisfy this signature. I could return the first element, the last element, you know, the median, the one in the middle, or maybe you know, the mean rounded up to the nearest integer or the size or something like this. So it's just, it's not very well constrained. The signature does not really constrain what's possible. But the first one actually does, because I don't know what the type T is, I really can't do anything with this method except implement the size method essentially. So foo one is really the size method. That's the only thing that makes reasonable sense here. And so we have this interesting kind of paradox that by making the type less specific, you know, T instead of int, we actually constrain the allowed possibilities for this method. And that helps us be more precise about thinking about the relationship between uh, abstractions that are public and implementations that are internal. So we're less likely to be surprised, less likely to have uh, you know, unexpected behavior or buggy behavior, whether you know, however we implement it. Uh, and it's just a very powerful capability in terms of constraining us in a way that actually produces better quality down the road. So I really like this idea of parametric polymorphism and I encourage you to uh, look at it in more detail. Now I wanna talk about something I've seen a lot in enterprise uh, code written in Scala. And that is the notion that because we have this you know, powerful type system, we should just type the hell out of everything. And the specific problem I'm talking about is some code I had to deal with not long ago that was basically uh, you know, YAML files for submitting pods to a Kubernetes cluster, where instead of just using a template and then like stuffing in the few values that I have to stuff in in my Scala code, um, the, the code I was looking at would just faithfully represent all of this structure in Scala code, effectively duplicating all of this knowledge, having this you know, do, problem of maintaining uh, two versions of the same thing, and not really adding any value over uh, just having a template and having the Scala code understand just the few things that it needs to be able to substitute into this template when it actually submits a job you know, in, in a Kubernetes cluster. My point being that sometimes we kind of fall into this, really it's an object oriented pattern of, oh, we should type everything. We should have our entire domain represented in source code. No, we really should not. We should only have the bare minimum that we need to express what we really need to say and nothing more and find other, thing, other ways to express the rest of the information like you know, templates that where I spend all my time making sure this template is right, not making sure the template and the Scala code are right. This dramatically reduces boilerplate in our Scala code and it eliminates all this duplication and so forth and so forth. So if you fall into this temptation, uh, really think twice about when you really want to use static typing for its benefits and when you should uh, not represent an idea in code, but maybe keep it more abstract, like use a hash map or you know some, some wrapper around YAML or JSON rather than immediately convert that into some object that you've declared or some type you declare. And I think if we do this then, um, and we leverage the concision of Scala, then we'll just have much less code and we'll avoid just translating our thinking about enterprise Java into enterprise Scala, which doesn't really give us that many benefits. 
And the last example about this point I'll make is that uh, if you think about, uh, this is one of my favorite examples that I talked about a lot about five years ago or so when I was doing a lot of Spark programming. This is a, a, an algorithm called the inverted index. It's sort of what a search index is based on in a very crude sense. But um, let me check the chat here quickly. Uh, the, the idea here, though, is that if you write this in, in um, um, a Spark, we get to leverage all of these functional combinators that we really love, like map, flat map, um, you know, split is not exactly, but sort of uh, reduced by key and so forth. And so we can write this whole algorithm in one page of code. And the thing is, if you really embrace these functional idioms, uh, really go for the most concise way of thinking about the types and what you need to express and how to work with them, then you dramatically reduce your code. And when you do that, then suddenly everything gets smaller. You don't need dependency injection anymore. Gosh, if I, if I dealt with problems with that, you don't need crazy mocking libraries for, for everything because you haven't managed your dependencies very well. And you can really get rid of a lot of the design patterns that are really uh, you know, used properly that they're good things, but when you have a lot less code, you have a lot less need for stuff like this. And you can actually you know, live with smaller numbers of services too. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about quickly is this problem of, um, uh, and I'll answer this question at the end about commutativity that came up. Uh, Here's a, here's a risk item that I see that's going to affect the growth of, of functional programming. You know, if you look at things like the Tyobi index, what you see is that, you know, some of these popular languages like Python and Go and Kotlin, they keep growing in popularity, but they're not really as, you know, strongly functional as we might like, right? Uh, in fact, um, I really hate working with Python, even though I work in the data science space a lot, I just feel really disabled in a sense when I'm working with it, because it just doesn't have the same kind of functional power and concision that Scala does. And yet it's, you know, its popularity has been growing enormously. I think Python is the light blue color that's, you can see it, according to uh, Tyobi, it's the, it's the number one language right now. All right, so why is this happening? Well, we know one reason, it's kind of obvious, but just to state the obvious, for a lot of people, functional programming is at least perceived as too advanced, even though they're actually using some of the constructs that have worked their way into languages like Java and Python and so forth. For most developers, it's either perceived as too hard or they lack the motivation to learn it. Whereas in contrast, object-oriented programming does have this kind of seductive quality that it seems intuitive, at least in a naive sense. I remember people saying this back in the day, just take your verbs and your nouns and drop them in your code, right? Model everything in your code. Well, it turned out we had a lot of problems with that, including unconstrained mutability. And th this issue I mentioned earlier, where we put stuff in code that really shouldn't be there, where we should maybe use templates or something you know, less formal, uh, you know, like hash maps or whatever. But I think the more interesting situation is that software development itself is changing. If you think about how we write software, it's still kind of a craftsman's business. A lot of the code we write is code that's been written before, but we just rewrite it with some minor changes for our needs. Uh, and so I think, and I really didn't like these terms, but there's only things I could come up with. There's kind of two kinds of programming. One I'm gonna call full stack and the other I'm gonna call service oriented. Um, so, but I do want to emphasize that, that, that I'm not saying that either one of these is good or bad. That they either both of them apply in contexts where they make sense, and they can even exist in the same relatively large in, uh, programming environment, community, whatever. So what, what I mean by full stack is the case where you think about I'm just going to uh, like do something that I'm going to pick maybe a big framework like Rails, or and I just picked Rails as an example because I used to do Rails programming, but mostly I'm going to write a lot of the logic myself my day is gonna be spent thinking about the uh, domain logic that I need to implement in this system. And I'm not gonna spend as much time thinking about deployment and production monitoring. Maybe I'm building an app for an IT environment where I just need to manage it on a few servers or something. It's, that's not my main problem. The main problem is just getting this complex domain logic, right? Maybe I'm writing accounting apps where the rules of accounting are somewhat complex. And I actually think though that functional programming is still the best way to do all of this. I mean, the, the kind of concision you can get, the way you can get a handle on the logic and express it concisely, this is really the, still the growth area for functional programming. However, the other place where we're seeing a lot of interesting change is what I'm calling service oriented. And that is that we're finally standardizing a lot of the stuff that we used to roll by hand 
in sort of a craftsman way. And Kubernetes, whatever you think or, or dislike about it, <coughs> the main value of it, in my opinion, is that it's actually just defining the standard for a lot of stuff that we often do. Like, how do I roll stuff out? How do I roll it back if I want to? How do I discover services? How do I load balance? You know, how do I orchestrate uh, storage over a cluster? How do I manage secrets? And on and on and on. This, this is a screen grab from the Kubernetes website on the right here. So a lot of my time these days, though the project I'm working on is thinking about how do we stand up highly resilient, highly scalable, uh, highly durable, highly flexible clusters and you know, provide the services that the, in this case, the, science, uh, the scientists who are writing these fancy toolkits at IBM, how do I make them as accessible as possible to their customers and as reliably delivered and all that kind of stuff. So when you're writing code like this all the time, you know, why use anything other than like Go or Bash even or Python or YAML? Because, um, you know, you tend to write small stuff. You're not really writing big complex logic so much. A lot of the sophistication is being handled for you by these standardized libraries. So maybe functional programming isn't as important to you. And I think this is one of the reasons that we're seeing maybe a stalling of the growth of functional programming and traditional languages are, you know, learning some of the lessons there and mixing in some of the ideas, but not really fully embracing FP. And I'll cite one other important example of this, I think, and that's in the data science world. You know, one of the reasons Python is doing so well, again, is because it's so popular among data scientists. Um, and, and if you look at what data scientists write, they really don't typically write a lot of code. They do have to have a lot of domain knowledge about what's the right statistical algorithm to use, or how, do, you know, how am I gonna apply neural networks to what I'm doing? Their expertise is not in programming, it's in this kind of, you know, well, just it's just in data science. So once again, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're basically scripting in Python or R uh, to do to, to, to drive the behavior of these very sophisticated toolkits like TensorFlow and PyTorch and SK Learn or Scikit Learn. Um, you know, maybe they're paying some penalties, like this tw uh, tweet that I uh, posted here, where you know sometimes you run into you know the fact that Python doesn't have strong typing or whatever. But nevertheless, for them, it's the perfect fit or near perfect fit. And so I think this movement towards finally figuring out good abstraction boundaries for a lot of commonly needed things like running clusters and all the services there, running uh, you know, data science applications using very sophisticated toolkits that where you kind of really hopefully still need functional programming to implement. It's kind of driving a lot of us to not really need the, the power of functional programming as much. So I'm a little concerned that you know, maybe this is going to decline over time, or at least it's going to stall out the growth of functional programming. So just to wrap up then, you know, once again, I think that this is a risk to us. It's actually a good thing that we're doing the standardization, but it does kind of threaten the growth of functional programming a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. I'll uh, go through the questions now, and I'm happy to uh, uh, also chat in the, in the session or the meeting room afterwards. So the first question here, um, Someone is asking about commutativity of a function object that he saw in the first few slides. I remember that it had a logical and between the two parameters and what it did. Okay, basically, uh, it used to be in Scala, you would say like, um, you know, my service or maybe my collection uh, extends uh, resettable with, uh, what was the other one I used? I forgot now, growable. Okay, and it turned out that uh, you, you could get into problems where maybe I happen to declare a collection where I mixed up like re or change resettable and growable to be growable first, then resettable. Logically, there's no reason those should be considered differently. I'm kind of mixing in unoverlapping behaviors, mostly. Um, so why, why should they be treated as logically distinct just because I declared them in, in one order? I'm, I'm, over, I'm just kind of ignoring a big exception to this rule for now. But but. The idea is that in set theory, it wouldn't, it doesn't matter what the order of things are. It's either in the set or it isn't. And I can talk about, you know, overlaps of sets, you know, the union or the intersection of sets, right? I'm not thinking at all about ordering of the objects in the set. And so that's the idea here is to bring more set theory into the type system by replacing the with keyword with the, you know, ampersand for and, and also uh, supporting the idea of like an extension of the either type, or instead of either having two types, I can have arbitrarily many uh, alternative types that are returned by some method. Uh, so that's the idea there. And they are commutative, at least, at, except for one big exception, which I won't get into. 
uh, we can talk about it in the, the little uh, chat room afterwards. Um, so someone's asking what the, uh, what the code means in terms of, uh, again, kind of this commutativity. Um, and they bring up a good point that if I, if I mixed up, I didn't mean commutativity in the sense that the order of methods that I call is independent. What I meant is that from the type theory point of view, those two uh, types that are declared as um, growable and resettable or declared as resettable and growable, they're considered equivalent from the point of view of the type system. Actually, you're getting to the exception I was sort of mentioning. How you call methods and how method resolution works is not commutative. Um, but the, from the type theory point of view, the objects are commutative. So that's what I meant there. OK, the last question here is, uh, uh, do you foresee that using languages like Scala and Haskell with type-oriented programming might make them interface uh, better with AI tools like Copilot? I, I actually think that would be true. I, I put in that uh, little tweet uh, grab in part because people do commonly run into uh, type problems and it would be better if they could express things. It might actually make optimization work better. In fact, most of those toolkits that are uh, written in Python often have these sort of side tools they've written to highly optimize the code. They're not really going through normal Python so much as going through highly uh, optimized uh, query planners that kind of the equivalent thereof. I think that could probably be easier to do in Scala or Haskell. And unfortunately in Python too, almost nothing's done in Python. At a certain level, you drop down into C and C++ code for performance reasons. So yeah, I think you could make a good argument. Actually, Haskell might even be better than Scala because a lot of people don't want to run JVMs anymore. So if we actually uh, like used Haskell for everything, uh, which actually can compile to very fast code, it might actually be far better in the long run. My sort of my hope is that Julia will be successful in the long term. It's it's another language that kind of could replace R and Python, uh, and it it solves a lot of these problems. Uh, okay, a few other questions, and then we're, we're going to be out of time, I guess. Uh, is Scala three ready for production? Yeah, it is. You, you can you can use it now. It's it it is very robust, and they went to a lot of effort to make it backwards compatible with Scala two. Either uh, in, in the syntax level, there's flags you can use to decide how much of Scala 3 versus Scala 2 syntax you want. And the libraries generally interoperate if you compile to, with Scala 2.13. And even with Scala 3, you can mix and match across uh, the, those boundaries. Um, and then the last question I'll take here is, do you think that FP could be used for uh, ML and uh, AI uh, if the community saw merit in it? Um, yeah, it's really a challenge of, you know, once again, data scientists are thinking about data problems and statistics. You know, a lot of them come from that background. They really want to think, they don't want to think about programming very much. A lot of them are good programmers, but they're really much more concerned about, um, you know, doing programming, uh, you know, doing data science. And, the, and they, again, it's, a, uh, um, uh, it's kind of seductive, the appeal of a very simple looking language like Python, even though you often run into roadblocks where, you can't really do some of the things you'd like to do in a more sophisticated language. Kind of the classic problem that, you know, beginner versus expert, you know. Um, so what they typically do then is they just rely on the toolkits to do most of the heavy lifting and they just kind of script what they want in their in notebooks or in Python or, or R is kind of a similar thing. Okay, I guess I should wrap up, I'm out of time. Thanks a lot, Dean. That was blazing through a lot of uh, <laughs> content, uh, but I think, uh, yeah, great, great summary of some of the things that is there in Scala 3. And uh, it was interesting to see your thoughts on uh, basically, uh, you know, the two types of uh, kind of programming jobs, if you will, uh, you know, and uh, where you think FP may shine, still continues to shine and where, uh, you know, service oriented might just be good enough where you could do. Uh, so that, I think that was interesting. Uh, I think we've uh, run out of time, but uh, again, I want to thank all the attendees for joining in and uh, thanks Dean for uh, taking the time this morning to be with us.